Corey, this is a piece that you wrote in 2020. Inflation adjusted K through 12 education spending per student has increased by 280 percent since 1960. Um, you know, so uh, on average, the U.S. spends over 15 grand a year per student. Um, where has that money gone? Because that, you know, and this is inflation adjusted. So it's, you know, it's not simply because everything is more expensive than in 1960. What are, mm -hmm. what are the main components of per pupil spending? Yeah, look, and that is from June of 2020. Um, so the, the spending is a lot higher now, even than it was mm -hmm. in 2020 because of all the so-called COVID relief I think uh, we've pumped $190 billion in, in so-called COVID relief into the K-12 school system since March of 2020, which is over three or $4,000 per student. So we spend a lot more now than we did then. And even then, if you just look between 1970 and um, 2019, with the latest federal data that we have nationwide, uh, per student, we've increased per, st per student education expenditures by uh, 150 two percent over that period and teacher salaries since 1970 have increased only by about eight percent so it's not going towards mm -hmm. the teachers in the classroom it's going more towards staffing surges and administrative blow if you look at a report by mm -hmm. ben scaffity uh, back to the staffing surge he looks at different periods of time finding that uh the the number of support staff in particular Re, re, raises exponentially in, in different locations, whereas student enrollment and teachers in this in the buildings is pretty stagnant. And I think that's because the current school system is a one size fits all monopoly that has no incentive to spend additional dollars wisely. So mm -hmm. they put it towards more people because more employees means more dues paying members for the, the teachers yep. unions, which means more money for people like Randy Weingarten, who make over five hundred thousand dollars a year. So and even, even, uh, but it's not even going to teachers, it's going to staff who then end up joining unions. That's right. And if you look between, uh, I've, I've took, there's a, been a image that goes around on Twitter pretty, pretty, uh, often that I was the first one to create it. I didn't put my name on it. Mm -hmm. I probably should have, but it's a graph between 2000 and 2019 using federal uh, data sources, finding that the number of students in the system increased by about 7%. The number of teachers in the system, similar, about yeah. 7 or 8%. But then the number of administrative staff increased by about 80%. So mm -hmm. looking at different periods, we find the same. Uh, the, what are, the same what are those trends. people doing? What are, what are the support staff? What are the non-instructional staff doing? Well, they, uh, a whole host of different things. Um, so in Los Angeles, for example... Uh, since 2019, they had a, a plan to of what to do with the additional 69% of spending that was going into the Los Angeles public schools. And the latest uh, report that I saw showed a, a, an increase of counselors by about uh, 80% mm -hmm. and, and a, an increase in, in teaching staff by a much lower, lower number, mm -hmm. while student enrollment over the same period was projected to, to decrease by about 6%. So in what other industry do you lose your customers, lose 6% of your customers, and then start hiring more and more people with Los Angeles Public Schools now spending um, in the latest budget, I believe over $25,000 per student. So they're just a whole host of different, you know, they're, they're yep. trying to make the schools, um, and they can, they can, they can, lay out arguments as to why it might be a good idea to have more counselors because well we closed the schools and we hurt the kids mentally so now we mm -hmm. got to fix the problems that we created by hiring more counselors yeah and so they just um yeah they'll, they'll throw everything at the wall see what sticks and and hire as many people as they can in any position um, Nick, if and, we, yeah go ahead Connor. i was just going to add briefly and tie us back to your uh, slide with the sat scores What's especially compelling about the data that Corey is describing is that if you look at the test scores across the same period of time, whatever chunks of, of time you want to look at, the test scores are flat. Now, mm -hmm. Corey and I, you know, are, are, we don't believe that standardized testing is the, you know, summum bonum of educational attainment, but right. it is an effective way to try and at least assess lightly uh, what the performance looks like. And test scores have not gone up. So the, yeah. the increases in investment and in, the administrative class of these schools may have its perks, may have its uh, stated purposes, 
but it's not trickling down to improving the education of the students. And that I think is what's most compelling about the problem is that uh, we're, we're chasing, uh, you know, putting b- bad money into a system that isn't ultimately serving the ideal uh, customer for which it purportedly exists. And- so we say right. We say in the book, ultimately, that why do schools exist now? It's not to educate students. It's a, a jobs program for adults. And right. the unions defending that is, is ultimately its core value proposition at this point. And these are just SAT scores for college-bound seniors um, in 1963, 68, 73, and 78. So kind of the years before that. And you see declines um, consistently through that. More recently, um, because I want to get to, you know, that's 40 years ago. We're essentially looking at 80 years of kind of uh, collapse. Corey, can you talk a little bit about what what were the emphases on school reform or education reform uh, starting in the in the 1980s into the early 90s? Yeah, a lot of this was uh, accountability mechanisms and mostly focused on standardized tests. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what I want to say is that the the failures have have changed and have become much beyond much further beyond uh, what can be captured by a standardized yeah. test score, and what we're seeing more recently is and what we highlight in the book is a lot of the non academic failures of the school mm-hmm. system too, such as them being controlled by the teachers unions and indoctrination that's happening in the schools as well, uh, and just having a one size fits all system that doesn't. Uh, will never meet the individual needs yep. of families who disagree about how they want their kids raised. And I think that's what we've seen a lot over the past couple of years. And we've seen some pushes from the top down to control the curriculum from one side. And mm-hmm. we've seen um, other reformers, such as myself, pushing from the bottom up to create more um, uh, of a thousand flowers blooming approach, right. uh, free market approach. That was an excerpt from Reason's live stream with Corey DeAngelis and Connor Boyack, the authors of Mediocrity, 40 Ways Government Schools Are Failing Today's Students. If you want to see the full conversation, go here. If you want to see another excerpt, go here and make sure to come back next Thursday, every Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern time, when Zach Weismiller and I are doing a live stream with somebody very interesting that you are definitely going to want to know about.